Yeah, let's talk about the MDP. Tee that up. And because I also, something that's interesting for me, I don't know MDPs very well. Okay. But I am familiar with reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning in particular. And it sounds like when you're talking about MDPs with markup decision processes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of some of the ideas here. So mm -hmm. Markov, for example, being that um, I believe that's the property that all of the information from the most recent time step is all that you need. Correct. So, if, so the Markov property, for example, applied to stock markets is that you don't need to know all of this. When you're assuming the Markov property, you don't need to know all the historical stock prices. Correct. You say, what were the stock prices yesterday? I'll use those, that one snapshot of data to predict today's. Right. So yeah. So technically what it means is I don't need to know the history in order to um, know what actions are available to me and to know the probability distribution on those transitions in the future. So in, in sort of the historical context of MDPs, that's what it would mean. Nice, nice. Right. And so um, other than that Markov property, um, something that seems very familiar to me from my understanding of reinforcement learning. So first of all, you apply reinforcement learning to solve sequential decision-making problems. Correct. Which are also using an MDP to solve sequential decision-making problems. And similarly with reinforcement learning, we're often talking about a state space. Yep. And um, so the state being the current situation that you're in. The state's what you, the information you need right, to um, make that next decision, right? It helps mm -hmm. define what decisions are available to me and also ultimately, you know, what the transition would look like if I made that decision. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you're in some state. So some way uh, in my textbook, Deep Learning Illustrated, I use the example of video games because I feel like that, because yeah. you can kind of imagine a video game like being frozen. So you know, yeah, you, exactly. You're, you know, you're you're controlling a, a joystick, but let's say you just pause, and so there's just a, a certain state on the screen. Let's say yep. you're playing Pong, where there's a paddle at the bottom of the screen, uh, and you so you're you find yourself at some state. You you can see where the Pong paddle is on the screen, and you learn through experience, or an algorithm, a reinforcement learning algorithm, can learn through experience that pressing left on the joystick will change the state so that the Pong paddle moves left. Yep. So you have a state, which is represented in the video game example by the pixels, pixels on the screen. Yeah. And then the action you take is the joystick uh, movement. And then that changes the state on the screen and you find yourself in a new state. And the state could remain fixed until you move the joystick again, or potentially in, a, in something like Pong, it could also be a ball moving. And so the state is changing. So in fact, you're actually, by not moving the joystick, you are taking the, you're making the decision, you're taking the action of not moving oh. as that state continues. Right, and, and you're, you know, even in Pong, um, well, maybe not in Pong, because the, the, if, if you had the physics and you could model the physics exactly, you would know what's going to happen. But in the real world, right, there's, there's exogenous things that are happening to you, right? There, um, you know, demand is happening, and I don't know what that demand is in the future. So that, that change from one screen to the next is is random in the real world and right. and so that that then adds another element into our mdp it's random typically around a probability distribution so if right. the demand for this car part that needs to be delivered from one location to another is a certain amount on one day or one month it's there's you could have a distribution around how likely it is to be needed um, the next month, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. It's unlikely to be a lot more or a lot less. Right, right. And so, I mean, there's always a probability distribution. It's right. just whether or not we know what it is, right? right? And and in the most complex problems, it might be really hard to even specify what that is, um, which is why when we solve these problems, uh, and or, or rather when we're trying to train something like machine learning, we would want to you know, in general, we turn to a simulation to do that, that because we, you know, we're not, we're not modeling that distribution exactly. We're using the simulation to, you know, um, advance forward in the, the time. So even when you started your career, you would have been doing simulations. So the first work I did, no, actually, we were, we were assuming a probability distribution existed 
uh, and one that we knew. And then we would, you know, if we could generally derive structure of the optimal policy without putting restrictions on that distribution, we would generally, we couldn't do anything with that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so then we would assume a particular distribution and try to, again, find structure, you know, optimal structure uh, from that, that assumption. But again, that's limiting. That's really limiting about what the world looks like. I have to make assumptions about this distribution. I, I may or may not know what that distribution is. And, you know, if you end up in a, a situation where that distribution is a result of, you know, many different actions. So take a, you know, queuing examples, for instance, though, those are very, very difficult to specify. So queuing examples. So queuing, um, so queuing is simply the, the you know, waiting lines, oh, yeah. but um, that could be you at the grocery store or well, nobody goes to the bank anymore. That used to be the classic example, but nobody does that. So maybe it's at, at the drive through, um, you know, so those, those, uh, it, it happens in, in terms of information processing, you end up with packets queued, things like that. So, um, you know, th those are there's distributions for, say, how long you're going to wait in line. But those can be v very, very difficult to even specify. So uh, a simulation can help us um, at least generate the, the data we need to take the, the step forward in time. Nice. And so the, the Markov decision process, it allows you to simulate in a way or it's just for evaluating a simulation? No. So, yeah, so Markov decision process is simply a, a model of our decision making, right? So in, in my Markov decision process, I have my current state. This is what I know about the world. And then that allows me to define the set of actions that are currently available to me. And what I want to do, um, let's say we're maximizing, I want to choose the action that is going to maximize the current reward, the reward that I'm going to receive right now from taking that action. So maybe it, you know, I'm going to choose to make a sale. So if I make that sale, I'm going to get an immediate reward on that. Somebody's going to pay me. Now, added to that though, is a second term. And that second term is an expectation of the future value that I can earn given what my current state is, as well as the action that I've just taken. So it becomes a conditional kind of expectation on that state in action pair. And, but since I've just made this sale, well, I've now, that now means in the future, I can't make and sell that exact same item, right? So that is impacting what that future cost or reward is 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 going to be um and so what i what you know if we were going to solve this exactly right then i i i would well ideally i i need to know that future reward for every single state and action pair right. and this becomes right that's the challenge of solving these exactly so now right. I just, I have this model of my decision-making process. And all of that stuff that you just said around the MDP. So it sounds like, oh yeah, now I'm, 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 the pieces are coming together for me. When I'm doing a reinforcement learning problem, it is a Markov decision process. It is a Markov. So it is it, the aren't Markov, different things. No, no, the, well, yeah. I mean, the Markov decision process is a model yeah. of the problem that you are solving with reinforcement learning. Right. So what I'm doing in reinforcement learning is I'm, you know, I, I have a state and then, you know, let's say if you're doing Q learning, I have a state and I take one of my actions, right? And that becomes the input into my, um, into my model. And then that output becomes a value of that state action pair. So that's, that's one decision then you step forward in time and because I've taken, I have a state and I have an action and now I'm going to move into some new state. And how I get to that new state is where the simulation comes in because there's going to be something that happens randomly between the current state and action I've taken and my future state, right? And it's going, so now it's going to be my current state, the action I've taken, 
plus what we call that exogenous information that then leads me into that future state. And we're simulating that exogenous mm. information. So we could create a program that simulates the environment exactly. that our reinforcement learning agent is then making decisions in. And so over time, you can build up through running the simulation many times, you can start to get a sense of, should I be making this sale now or making other offers first? Well, I'm, I'm using the reinforcement learning to learn what I should do because right, I right. do an entire sequence of decisions and now I can just do a backward pass. I know the value of each of those decisions. And so now I can do that backward pass. I can add it all up going backwards. And now I know, oh, here is for that particular trajectory, this, the actions that I took, this is now a sample of the future value of that particular action in this particular state. And so now we start running many, many trajectories using our, our simulation. So now though that's the information that we are using to update using the reinforcement learning techniques, you know, essentially if we're using a neural net, update our, our neural net based on each of those trajectories. And then hopefully at some point in the future, we converge. But um, I know you've done a lot of work in reinforcement learning in some areas. And one of the things that is challenging in, in the environments that I've worked in is that um, getting to convergence can be really, really challenging. There's a lot of, and, and maybe we're just bad at our design of our, of our, our neural nets, but um, we find that we, we get a lot of, uh, I think, jumpiness in the, mm -hmm. in the, in the values of our policies that we're returning. Yeah. So converging, meaning like getting, having just kind of nice and smooth roundly getting to that maximum reward, right. As opposed to hopping all over the place. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And so I guess a, another key term here to note is that, so we've been talking about reinforcement learning a lot. We've been talking about neural nets. And when those two things are combined, like you've been describing, that is deep reinforcement learning. That's deep reinforcement learning. Because it, and what you're approximating in that particular case is you're using it to approximate the value of the future. Now, you could, of course, also use some sort of policy gradient approach. And then, you know, you're directly learning the, um, you know, the distribution on the, the policy, but. Um, yeah, um, and, and, and a weird thing about, at least my understanding of this deep reinforcement learning term is that it doesn't matter. So typically when we, when we talk about neural networks, it's only a deep learning architecture if it has say like three hidden layers. Multiple or layers, right. But we can call it deep reinforcement learning even if we just have a single hidden layer in our neural network. And like, we don't call it like shallow neural network Reinforcement learning. That's true. We, I, everything is, is deep reinforcement learning now, regardless of the number of layers that, that yeah. we use. Yeah, that's true. Um, but so, uh, sorry, I kind of I jumped in with that as you were starting to talk about policy a bit more. I feel like policy is a term that maybe we should define. I mean, at the, yeah. at the onset of the episode, you talked about policy, and it was so, you know, we moved on from that so quickly that it, all, it sounds like, you know, like an insurance policy. Yeah, or right. So, <laughs> so a policy is a mapping from a state to an action uh, or to a decision. And, and that's all a policy is, right? It, it's, like, I guess it's, it's like a term that you could kind of use in normal, in normal language. Like you could be like, when I see a pedestrian on the road, I have a policy of hitting the brake. <laughs> exactly, no, that, that, that would be, that would exactly, right? You, it's, a, it's a mapping from what you've seen, right? So even going back to the Pong example, what you're seeing is that, that set of picture, yeah. pixels, that's our state. That's the input, and now we get an output that's telling us hit the brake. When I see the pong ball move to the right, I have a policy of moving the pong yep. uh, paddle <laughs> to yes, the right. The paddle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Um, cool. So, all right, we've covered a lot of terms. So, um, to kind of quickly recap, um, actually, you could phrase this better than me. Link the describe how you do this perfectly when you say um, the connection between reinforcement learning and, and Markov decision process. So the Markov decision process is a model yep. of the problem that you're seeking to solve. Right, right, right. Reinforcement learning is the process by which we take to learn the 
op well, it's not optimal, but to, to learn to, the yeah. best possible policy we can yeah, yeah, yeah. for the the problem that we've modeled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then so within that world, we've got state, which is like pixels in the video game. We've got actions we can take, which is like the joystick in the video yep. game. Um, and we have policies, which is, yeah, the mapping of that state to some particular action. And so this scales up from our small Pong example to very complex problems like you have in logistics, mm -hmm. where a given logistics company like Schneider would have thousands of trucks all over the country, all over the US, maybe probably internationally traveling as well. Right going to a parts factory in Canada and bringing the part down to Michigan. Yeah. And so you've, you're, and you're trying to optimize kind of across all of this, how can we minimize driver time or minimize fuel expenditure? Yeah. Um, and so this, this framework, this reinforcement learning framework, it, it scales up to these very complex problems it does, right? So what we're, we're using um, reinforcement learning and the neural net for, right, is, you know, let's, let's go back to Q-learning, right? We want to learn the value of that second term of our Markov decision process, that reward that we can earn in the future, given this state, given this action. 